used to be better than this. Pathetic! Ah, <sighs> I sure am glad that Megamind 2 is behind us. I certainly would hate if there was another four hours stint to go through. Oh my god! Yes, because after Mega Mind vs. the Doom Syndicate, apparently Peacock wanted more. So there is still another four hours of this terrible Mega Mind content to go through, and the last one already put me into a fever for five days. Why are they doing this to us? What did we do to deserve this? And look at it all. This is just shuffled footage from the entire series. We'll get into specifics in a minute. It just looks the bloody same, doesn't it? It's just the exact same minuscule budget. And you're gonna notice a lot of recurring things from the mainline movie, which is so just a 90 minute extended episode. If you haven't checked out our breakdown of the original Megamind 2, I'd certainly say go watch it. There's some important lore to learn. There's a supermarket set, a child exists, and also a post credit scene that leads into a super new villain. Thankfully, it's not for Mega Mind 3, it's for this. This is a sequel to Mega Mind 2, and oh my god, wait till you get to the ending. It is, it is something else. But first, we have episode 1 Mega Mind vs. Dude Monkey. That's what it's called, that's what one of the characters is. They're introducing new characters to extend the Mega Mind universe, so now we've got more supers. You've already got the perfect Superman parody with Metro Man. Obviously, you got Mega Mind. You got Hal the Human with a nice, nuanced element of the nice guy who's actually bad. And then, of course, you've got the terribly CGI Doom Syndicate. But now, on top of all that, you've got a dude in a monkey suit. Not just any dude. He's a dude who looks like you'll get rabies if he sneezes in your food. This whole episode is meant to be the classic rivalry episode. You know how there's kind of loads of these terrible low-budgeted TV series and they all have the same plots? It's just, what if the sidekick was a protagonist? What if people body swapped? What if there was a new rival? That's exactly what this is. And you know what? It feels like it's one big Megamind 2 homage because it's just the exact same design. We go right back to Megamind's crappy rendition of his building without the big astronomy dome. And then when we come to meet Dude Monkey, it's inside the supermarket that they montaged into that one time. Clearly Peacock made eight sets, so we're just gonna find an extension for all of them. Also, there's an intro sequence now. It's like three shots and one of them is 20 seconds long for some reason. But yes, the weird timeline of where this series is meant to sit in the world continues to be confusing because we're immediately right out the gate Megamind brings out the idea to be more popular by asking the question is do i need to exercise what about flossing sir immediately it's a 2016 movie we're still talking about the bloody floss dance and it's 2024 see the whole thing is that Megamind wants to be popular he now wants to be an influencer that is actually the plot that they were murmuring about in the rumors building up to this and now here it is. Kaiko is this child gremlin thing that seems to know the knowledge of God. And she has TikTok. She's influencing the ways of Mega Mind's appearance. And he wants to get the crowd on his side as the new hero. All the while, Dude Monkey's now made an appearance, flip flopping around, do gooding against crime, and he has his own social media bit. So, you know, yeah. It's just lowest common denominator, a classic trope of the rival villain mixed with influencers. And take it from me, an actual influencer, what a scourge on society this episode is trying to be. On the other side of things as well, Roxanne is mayor now. That was a thing they established in the film because her being a journalist is far too weak for her. And she comes to the news that immediately the Doom Syndicate have escaped. Again, so the whole movie, kind of a waste of time. The Doom Syndicate are intertwined with this TV series fully. They're just out and about doing things. Some episodes will have them. They're just fodder. I mean, Peacock spent all of their budget producing Behemoth and they're not having enough money to fire the guy and get a second design. So I guess they're gonna keep reusing them. There's also now another character that's been upgraded as a main character. It's the assistant to the mayor. Fascinating, I know. And she is now meant to be the bickering sibling to Megamind. They just never agree. They fight over a piece of paper and rip it in half. Wow, storytelling. Never heard that one before. And then to keep things even more confusing, Megamind doesn't know what the internet is at all. Maybe that vaguely makes sense because he spent all of his time in prison. 
But then they go on to define what the word trolling means. Oh, what's with this troll business? Trolling means he's trying to humiliate you online. And like, does anyone ever say you've been trolled anymore? This is like a 2010 reference. Whilst at the same time, they also reference fidget spinners. So again, we're in 2016. But there's TikTok on the phone. It's 2024. The rest of this episode is just kind of your standard schmuck. Dude monkeys out here doing a good job. Mega Mind is jealous and trailing behind. They keep Chum over here, who was Minion, but they've just permanently actually changed his name and they're not going to address it any further than that. He just comes out making incredibly archaic references to the internet. Sir, have you seen this unusual fellow who sings about rage? Chum! I don't think that's endearing. It's just dated. Ugh, oh, and like... Ugh. And really, what you're just watching unfold for 23 minutes at a time is just a complete bastardization of Mega Mind as a world and Mega Mind as a character. Look at what they do to our boy. Hey, radical dudaroos, Mega Mind here. Crimes are popping. Damn. This is so embarrassing to the character of Mega Mind and is so disingenuously slapped together. Mega Mind then comes to find that his bloopers are successful and go viral on the internet. And then Dude Monkey is exposed as a fraud who staged all of his things. Wahoo, Nighty Night is there, vaguely attached to a post credit scene. Oh, and Chum made a meme of his own. Pretty chill, homeboy. I think you've gone viral. And this, folks, is just an appetizer for things to come, for just the abhorrent design everything is in the next three and a half hours. Strap in. Even the credits are just bloody blowhorns this time. Episode 2 brings back an old new character from Mega Mind vs. the Doom Syndicate and elevates him some more. It's all about the origins of Mr. Donut. So of course, we're at the donut place again. Who'd have thought? We, we ended in the aquarium last episode, now we're in the donut place as well. They have a whole thing about they love the donut place now. Mr. Donut wants to show them the backstage of the donut. He's invented a new Mega Mind head donut that Mega Mind's not allowed to eat for some reason. And then Mr. Donut falls into a vat of donut. It's your classic super villain origin story. And to be fair, they kind of play off of that. That's the gag. So eventually they pull him out and it, it, it's just so poorly animated. But now he is permanently sticky, stuck inside his costume and everything attaches to him. With Mr. Donut saying all these suspicious lines, like Mr. Donut will take over the world because he really enjoys his business, Megamind is convinced he'll become a supervillain. After some hijinks as well, Megamind attaches a laser gauntlet to his arm and he's practically set off and ready. All the while, the gang discover a sheet that Mr. Donut was putting together. Opera pay Mega? Oh, I found a clue. Are you serious? Do you think the audience have concave heads or something? This is the stupidest, most simple sheet code I could possibly put together. Anyway, because of uh, plot, Mr. Donut now also has amnesia. Classic, I forgot how to write storytelling. And the fish trio drop down onto Mr. Donut, gushing all about how they're honored to be with Metro City's newest bad guy. All the pieces come together for him to completely forget himself and actually become that supervillain now. He even has a great super evil laugh, incredible. And Roxanne sees it all. So the girls go and meet up in the donut place and oh my god! Operation Payback Megamind? Wow! That's a genius bloody job, Roxanne! I love the part where you scribbled it in and then it came out scribbled in reverse to how you scribbled it in! And so as a climax to the episode, Megamind is caught by Mr. Donut and the Fish Trio. He's ready to shoot him into a pool of sharks. And then the girls blast in with Mr. Donut's wife and kids. I don't know why they were with him considering he was originally incredibly depressive and, and a non-character in Megamind 2. But don't worry about it. And they're like, your donut skills, they're for good, not for evil. Oh, you're right, my name is Mr. Donut, not... Dr. Super Evil Laser Robot Man, or whatever he said his name was. Megamind does the whole calling out to him about... ...decision. What kind of person did I really want to be? And then they, they do a fight, they get jailed, they all eat donuts. Ugh. I'm only a quarter way done, but let's do it. Episode 3. This one's called Roach Hard with a Vengeance. This 
is all about cockroaches. It doesn't involve Roxanne, it doesn't involve the outside world at all, I believe. It's just entirely Megamind's lab. Also, a thing to note, um, what keeps recurring in this TV series is the child Keiko here keeps repeating the old title for this TV show. It wasn't always called Megamind Rules. It was called Megamind's Rules for Defending Your City. Kind of awkward to have changed your title considering it is baked into almost every episode's dialogue. And welcome to Megamind's Guide to Defending Your City. I'm Keiko. So after more eye-rollingly boomer lines like how Megamind says live screaming instead of live streaming, Chum here starts to clash with Kaiko because he has to clean up everything. Apparently Kaiko lives in the lair now whenever she's not at school, so she's constantly chewing crisps and leaving crumbs on the floor. All the while, Megamind is trying to film stuff with Keiko and Chum keeps interrupting by the ways of faulty equipment because of the dirt or other things. You know, is vaguely plot. But anyway, where the real thing comes together is cockroaches appear. Oh my god. And Megamind is apparently scared stiff of the damn thing. So Megamind runs to his dorm room, which is just next to the lobby now? Uh, I thought it was in a basement. And Chum accidentally sprays it with Intelligence Booster. Why do they have that? Why have they used it before? What is it? All right. And now the cockroach queen is a super genius, just like Megamind. And she's like, I'm gonna use the spray to make a super evil intelligent army of roaches everywhere. To which the recurring response to that is... That's actually a pretty airtight evil plan. No, it's not! Use a bloody brain cell, please! If everybody's smart, then they're probably gonna clash intellectually about what's the next best thing to do. They're gonna disagree on everything. But no, it's an, it's an airtight evil plan. Cockroaches could take over the world if they had one stat in intelligence. There's no issues about their size. They're invulnerable, right? Nuke them. They're fine. Uh, so, uh, so this cockroach queen is now blackmailing Megamind in the Doom Room in order to get them to give over the intelligence can. Saying like she's gonna do terrible things like swim in his mug, put her skin in his shoe and walk on his face. Oh god, I hate this. And so it all just becomes one big chase sequence of an army of cockroaches versus Keiko and Chum. There's a bunch of machines they could use, none of them work out. A particle collider could atomize the can. Megamind is beaten by a cockroach. They go for the time extrapolator, but only put it two seconds into the future and then give up on that now. The parakeet robot from the climax of the movie version, that flies away with the can and then hits the glass ceiling. And then the cockroach even goes as far as to override the controls of Chum's suit, which apparently is a thing it could do. And Megamind doesn't have the power to fight the one intelligent cockroach in his room. Because there's a backstory to be had. Thankfully, this one does not entirely tarnish the legacy of the original movie. It takes place within the prison that he lived for his entire life, except making friends with the Doom Syndicate, creating a team of supervillains, and having a mentor, but we'll get there later. As it turns out, Megamind, go ahead and tell us. No, attracted every roach in the prison using my face as a dining hall. Cockroaches walked on his face once. Brilliant. So anyway, the action continues. Keiko stops the suit override, almost falls to her death. They are now rekindled. Wahoo. The cockroaches do get the can, spray all of the cockroaches, and then uh, there's no problems with that. They talk maths and then listen to their leader blindly. I don't think this show understands what intelligence is. <laughs> the next sequence is then all of the roaches walking towards the city exit. They just walk. There's no need to run. That would require anything other than brain cells, apparently. But also, the whole time where everyone's trying to stop them from moving, we never actually see them really moving on the floor. Not. It's mostly them looking down and stepping out of camera. And to save the day, there's the great suck it machine or whatever. They turn it on, everybody gets sucked in. The cockroach queen shuts it down, and so then they keep walking, completely nonchalant, repeating the walk cycle from before as if they weren't just inhaled by an entire suck it machine thing. Then Megamind finally has the strength to swap the queen away from the circuit breaker. Doing so by turning on the final Megamind video he just recorded to inspire himself. Wow, what a narcissist. And then it turns on and all the cockroaches are gone. So then they rocket them into the sky. Give us one more incredibly lame catchphrase. Granola? More like Rayesla. Keiko now gets their own desk and a trash can so they don't make a mess, and the cockroaches end up on another planet. Ugh, what a plot line. 
Episode 4 is the halfway mark, and it's called Mega Mayor. You know the episodes where the two main characters inevitably swap bodies? It's that. This time, Lady Doppler is around for the sake of uh, showing off the Doom Syndicate, I guess. And Megamind's like, how hard is it being mayor of Metro City? Because this guy has bloody zero brain cells inside of his giant gaping forehead. So it becomes a montage of both of them screwing it up. Megamind, as Roxanne, as the mayor of Metro City, is saying yes to absolutely everything. You need to find a new place to park your cars? Park in the park. That's why it's called a park. That, that's, that's as far as the writing really gets on that. But because he's getting a lot of satisfaction, he's like, I'm going to make Roxanne the most popular mayor in history. Ah. Meanwhile, Roxanne is Megamind, the hero of Metro City's out here, and Keiko the child just immediately works out it's Roxanne, because of course she does. In Megamind 2, you know, the movie version of this whole <laughs> fiasco, she just knows everything all the time. Ultimate god powers that knows the entire plot. It's exactly the same in this TV series. Megamind under Roxanne's rule is much nicer now, saying they appreciate charm and enjoying the music that's going on. Not very good at shooting a robber, but hey, you know, whatever. Actually, in doing so, she ends up destroying the streets, but that's, that's pretty on point for Megamind anyway, so like, what, what, uh. That being said, Roxanne Megamind is such a people pleaser to the people around her that they, that it enables the damn song composer to stitch together this damn music track that they play on loop throughout this episode. Why are you putting us through this? Please stop. And so one montage later and everything's gone to crap in both directions. Lady Doppler is vaguely appearing, zapping televisions in that one supermarket set. Megamind's image has been going down and saying yes to everything as the mayor has made everything go awful. From parking to driving to a snow globe in the middle of the street. You know, vague plot. There's a bit about how there wants to be a dog rally at some stadium, and then there was wants to be a cat rally at the stadium, and she said yes to both. It's very stupid. Incredibly basic as well. And then, like, Megamind as Roxanne has to give a speech, and, and this is the writing he comes up with. I think you're all marvelous and really cool and stuff. It's, it's like, beyond tropey. Doesn't Megamind like presentations? Is he? How can he not construct a sentence? This is so bad, both from Megamind as a character and from whoever wrote this schmuck. I generally don't have an actual problem with the team behind this series, you know? They're clearly just animators with no budget and no time. This is mostly a Peacock executive thing. But also, where does Peacock hire these writers? There is no intention here. This isn't an underrated writer with an undercooked prompt. The animators are fine though. It's just the resources and the leaders, I tell ya. Anyway, Lady Doppler makes a scene. We used to be better than this. Pathetic! Uh, and then we loop around one last time with Megamind Roxanne's speech about how if we could imagine being in the other person's shoes, we could love each other, cat-dog person. It's just so babyish. All that nuance from the first movie, a deep point that's actually gonna require a good bit of like emotional intelligence to understand and process, gone. We then start to get to a vague climax of the episode whereby Doppler has tied up Megamind as Roxanne. Still not really getting weather right, which is just the stupidest gimmick. Why does she point to rain and say it's sunshine? What's wrong with her? That's not even really funny. And then it's solved almost immediately by Chum throwing the snow globe onto her. Now Metro City loves both of us again. Ah, and then they revert. Perfectly timed, it was a wearing off thing anyway. Well done, wrap it together, we're beyond the halfway mark of this damn stupid show. No, don't play the bloody song again! Can't move, and a dove does poo, and a ghost goes boo. What even are these lyrics? Episode 5 is called Extra Credit. And this one's probably the most progressive of the bunch. Because there is practically recreational drugs in this episode, Chum here is calming himself down by zapping his circuits with this Electro Ball game. All the while, Roxanne is trying to be British. Old English synonyms you couldn't possibly know. I'm no Yorkshire raggedy fishwife. What the hell was that? And really, this is all about Megamind and Roxanne's relationship. You know, the one they kind of tarnished from the first movie, and just completely reset and put into this weird limbo. 
as the other plot line, Keiko has to create a robot that can throw a tennis ball. I don't know what kind of super school she's going to, but that's apparently a thing. Kind of would have been helpful at the end of Megamind 2, to be honest, considering Megamind invented a tennis ball throwing machine, which was a classic tennis propulsion machine. Is it because they just wanted to use the tennis ball asset again from the movie? They literally built nothing else? And then on another front, Roxanne knows Keiko's teacher. And so those two instantly meet... with their horrendous looking hands. The whole thing is about Megamind being jealous of a potential other romantic rival. You know, it's another one of those cliche TV plot lines. You've seen these all before. In fact, what could some boring normie normalton have to offer friendship wise over moi? This is literally the how plot line. How do you put Megamind through this nice guy rival trope and then turn him into the bloody nice guy normie trope? Tell me you do not understand the original movie without telling me you don't understand the original movie, my god! So then they go to that damn donut place again because there is no other place to have a romantic experience here because there is no other set that exists here. And Megamind has adjusted Keiko's science experiment to create the PAL 3000 to throw tennis balls and be the perfect good super friend like Roxanne has with the teacher. So Roxanne is embarrassed by this whole example and then goes on to say I'd say he's not normally like this, but my nose would start growing And that should really be the end of that quote, right? Like a boring line to mention? Probably not really that interesting Why did I show it off? Well, I'll tell you why I showed it off It's because of the next line following that Whereby apparently the teacher here has something to say about it I wonder what profound thing he has to say about the Oh man, Megabyte's always like this, hee hee ha ha. I, my nose would start growing if I said that. <sighs> he says... <laughs> like Pinocchio. Because you'd be lying. Are you advertising this show for people that just came out of the womb? Why are you explaining that Pinocchio means lying? How stupid is the audience demographic meant to be? And then the real plotline comes together when Pal is sad that the friendship with Megamind has to end in order to become the science project that Keiko wanted. So it goes on a mad dash for everything, trying to find a new Megamind to be best friends with. Throwing everything that's not Megamind. To which Megamind then tries to sort the situation, it grabs Megamind and goes to climb a skyscraper with Megamind with him. I don't know if it could drive up walls, but apparently it can. D don't ask about it. And then it all loops around with Chum's orb thing being thrown up not by Chum, the gorilla suit robot thing. No, by Roxanne the mayor, throwing it up the entire height of the skyscraper for Megamind to catch to short circuit the robot. Oh my god. They save Megamind from the fall. Keiko does a demonstration in the hallway. The robot makes friends with another robot. And then Roxanne says they didn't really have that much in common with the teacher. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Oh, welcome to the halfway mark of this video. Thank you for making it this far in. You now know more of the Megamind cinematic universe than the entire movie already established. Congratulations. It only gets worse from here. The ending is something else. But we'll get there soon enough. Do check below if you've subscribed or not if you want to keep up with future terrible TV series and movies. I might do a marathon of other low budget TV series at this point, so give me a suggestion for them. But in the meantime, I hope you enjoyed this breather into the rest of this god awful show, Mega Mind Rules for Defending Your City. The title they cancelled and then changed after they baked it into the dialogue. What a great decision. Peacock really are cementing themselves as the absolute worst. Let's get back to the video. Episode 6 is too much chum. You know how there's always an episode that focuses on the sidekick? Here it is. After a montage of dealing with the Doom Syndicate in an alleyway for six hours, I guess, Megamind is exhausted the next day. And instead of taking a nap or going to sleep at any point, he refuses to and continues to work. Ah, yes, of course. Thank you, chum. This isn't even funny or smart. It's not even anything. We learn that Megamind uses a binky and that now everyone else is going to take charge in order to make things better. Keiko's leaving for school. Roxanne has to do some mayor things, so it's all up to chum. With this Megamind that's hallucinating butterflies, apparently, and really just going through the five stages of grief because he's tired, chum says he could use an assistant for his assisting at a clone machine. 
already exists. Okay. Choosing to trade intelligence for persistence. Chum 2 accidentally flings Megamind in his chair. But with this now, Chum can go to the sh- But with this now, Chum can go and get tickets to a show that Megamind will totally want to see in his deprived state or something. So then the episode all about Chum Chum's not really helping the plot. Instead, what he's doing is he's bickering with the assistant mayor thing who's also trying to get tickets for Megamind for this show that's apparently gonna wake him up. He clearly just needs a nap. So then the clone version of Chum makes another clone version of Chum, but this one's a perfectionist who's always cleaning up. And Megamind says, I need a passionate Chum. So then Chum 3 clones a Chum 4 that's only passionate, overactive, and insensitive. So then Chum 4 clones a Chum 5 who's now a sensitive Chum who cries about hurting Toast. Y you know what I- you know? You know. I think even a cloning episode is a classically done TV trope that just- Ugh, repeats itself through every IP imaginable. And so it just becomes one big cacophony now that there's, I think, five different chum clones running around. Meanwhile, the main chum is trying to get more lottery tickets by doing good deeds, assisting the people in the queue waiting for these tickets because it's a lottery system. And then they, they do. They give away their show tickets for iguana food that they were going to go shopping for later. It, why would you give away show tickets for... Food! You can have both! Spend your money wisely! And so then they all hoard up all of the lottery tickets somehow. Homeless guy makes a reappearance very, very briefly because they model the character, they're gonna use it. And Keiko now returns at the end of the day, despite the lighting not changing at all, it's permanently sunset, it feels like, through Megamind's lair windows. And Keiko, having just walked in, immediately. Ugh, immediately has worked out what's happened again, knows that Chum needed help, and so cloned a Chum, who then cloned a Chum, who then cloned a Chum, and then had Megamind do a Mega Meltdown. How, uh, why do you know everything, you child? And you know what Chum says in response to all that, Chum 5, I imagine? No. Well, actually, yes. Where are the jokes? A 40-foot behemoth is here now. Don't know why he's 40 feet just is. Keiko's running around trying to stop all four chums from assisting, even though there were five chums. D don't worry about it. The clone, the persistent one, the passionate one, the sensitive one, and the happy one. And one chum gets loose. Or is this the secret fifth one? I can't follow. Happy Chum suggests they sneak up on Behemoth in the invisible car, and they say that's not a bad idea for some reason. And the four other chums that were inside the lair decide to combine themselves to create a super chum. A giant chum faces giant behemoth. And then in more like egregious storytelling that like, I don't get why they keep doing this. Megamind finally falls asleep after dozing about how this is all a dream and he has laser eyes and all this, you know, stupid plotline stuff. Chum then defeats behemoth and then they all turn around and say, Megamind did it. Megamind's asleep in the road right now. And then to even more turn the plotline around, Megamind says this city will be the death of me, so Giant Chum now decides to destroy the city before it destroys Sir. Meanwhile, the main Chum wins the lottery tickets to the show, gives it to the assistant because uh, Megamind needs assisting right now and he'll rather lose to another assistant. Like, what? I don't know. They wake up Megamind because th th there is no rest for the wicked. And they save the day by going with this thing about how Chum cannot ignore instructions from lyrics. This was a running gag through the episode that it wasn't even worth re-showing, to be honest. And so what follows next? Oh, God. I haven't even been talking about the animation errors throughout this entire TV series, right? You've seen it, I would hope. It's all- it's- it's in this video. But this one's, like, so egregious. They're inside of the car, Chum sticks his head out to shout out lyrics, and you can just- Run away with a nice smooth motion, make a beeline for the deep blue motion. Why did they think they would get away with this? This is a proper Jimmy Neutron of a TV show. Anyway, they improv some lyrics. Your hands like a crazy mutt. Be mellow. Don't crush Mr. Donut. And then the assistant gives Chum the lottery tickets back. It doesn't matter. They're both going to Mega Mind either way, saying us assistants have to stick together or whatever. And then the Doom Syndicate are here with a hairbrush, whereby the mentor, Mackie of Villain from the end of Mega Mind 2, says the Binky is integral to the entire plan. And you'll have to get someone else to do it yourself. The child. He's targeting the child for some reason. Yes, there is a lingering story arc going on in the background of this. The Doom Syndicate are doing nefarious things in the background. Is that good storytelling? No. 
Episode 7 is a cake for Keiko. They they really pulled out all the stops to work out the pun on that one. Once again, they're name dropping. Welcome to Megamind's rules for defending your city. Uh, but also, talking about name dropping, they just outright start naming the big bad final villain. Randomly. Megamind's completely unprovoked in talking about his mentor, but suddenly he goes out here to say... Airbrush was missing. Machia villain's golden hairbrush. Okay. Why? All right. They then go on to explain that that belonged to his great evil schoolmaster. The greatest bad guy who ever lived had long hair and a great voice. Wicked schemes, power cords, and presentation, he says. That's vaguely interesting. The fact that they could actually show off that his mentor was all into presentation as well. Great. Show us some of that, you know? And also, Megamind defeated him when finishing his training as a villain. Whenever the hell that was. Meanwhile, also, the main plotline is that it's Keiko's birthday today, given a drone by Roxanne, and Megamind completely forgot. To which Keiko says, that's fine, I already know what my present should be. The thing you said from the movie that you that we had before that our audience has already watched, for sure. They're proper making like a cinematic universe. You have to watch two hours of content, and then three hours to lead up to this point to know what's going on. But it's for this line here. You help me. I'll train you to be a crime fighter. You to which Megamind completely rejects, despite the fact that it's this child's birthday and he's meant to be the good guy. He's like, no, I'm not going to train you. Uh, get out of here. Self-teaching's the best teacher. You get out of here. I had a teacher. I don't want it. Goodbye. Oh, all right. Instead, he's going to make a cake for Keiko. The entire half of his episode is making a cake. First, it's too hard. Then it's too soft. Then it's too salty. Plotline. The real meat and potatoes of this story comes from Keiko getting revenge. She decides to infiltrate the Doom Syndicate and find out what's going on. Disguising herself as Nighty Knight, because now she has Megamind's watch for some reason. And so then that means there's no point for Machia Villain to be aiming after the child like we just established in the last episode, because she's going to him. So Keiko, in her godly child ways, immediately knows where their secret hideout is in some office. Why not help Megamind at this point? Why not tell him here? I guess because they've broken up briefly? I don't know. At the same time, the old mayor is here. Because once again, they've modeled a character. Might as well use him again. And, and it, it's really just crappy bad plot lines again. They start laughing and bullying the mayor because... You're a bunch of bullies! <laughs> His feet are dangling! <laughs> <laughs> what, what is this? Keiko as Nighty Knight is almost called out for not bringing sandwiches now that he's back from prison. What? And then there's other beats like how Behemoth is struggling with the computer and wants to print out his favorite comics out of the printer. <sighs> that being said, I do like this next line that Behemoth says. Completely out of left field and way more mature than the rest of this whole series. Patient or Behemoth crush and melt your bones. Whoa, calm down there, buddy. Anyway, Keiko reveals herself to the mayor as her secret identity. He's like, I do taxes, food delivery, and glass figurines. Uh, which is actually somehow vaguely attached to the plot. Meanwhile, Lady Doppler is crazed about this new nighty night because... Yes! One of us finally learned how to type! Again, what bloody decade is this? Is it meant to be like early days computers that we don't know how things work? Are they trying to get onto Facebook.com? Or is this a comment about iPad kids not knowing how to use keyboards efficiently because they're used to buttons and apps now? What is going on? Anyway, and then the other Nighty Knight appears and the Doom Syndicate prefer the new Nighty Knight and think they're real because they know how to type. All the while, Machia Villain also makes an appearance. Oh, we have an imposter in our midst. And he immediately sniffs out that it's the one wearing the Megamind disguise generator. Wow, this villain is serious because it has a third brain cell. So then Keiko isn't immediately burnt to a crisp. Instead, Mucky Villain says to prove her loyalty by stealing Megamind's baby binky as it's the power source to everything. To which Keiko does, running into the Megamind lab, using her drone to lead all the bots away, running to his bedroom. You know, that old set again from Megamind 2 that they for some reason built like for, for two 30 second scenes. She grabs the binky and takes it over to the ex-mayor of all people to get an exact copy, which he could just do in 15 minutes. What, what is this plot line? Are we even trying here? No, we're not because on the other side of things, 
Roxanne is just tickle torturing a mega mind for information about the mentor. Uh, because I don't want to put cake out through what I went through. <sighs> so what we come to learn is this Binky is needed to restore Machia villain's main body. He's not meant to be a floating brain head. He's not another minion like I first thought or something. No. And so instead what they do is they combine all the artifacts from across the past episodes because they've been doing some nefarious things in the background. We have the snow globe from that one episode. There was a moment about a genetic starfish I didn't tell you about. The French guy got an isotope during that late night alleyway scene. And Machiavellan's evil hairbrush gets his DNA back. And with the power of the binky all together. But I just gave you a fake binky, dude. And I got the real one right here. What is... Ah! Why would you say that? It ruins all tension and build up and payoff. You know, the most basic thing in writing to keep things impactful is see it dysfunction don't just say i gave you the fake binky bye ah! so then the child just runs away from them the entire time running down an alleyway running between the entire doom syndicate kaiko gets pierre pressure to hypnotize himself by recording and playing back his own thing and the doom syndicate are defeated by a child again to which the brain says that actually they took the real one using the monologue to swap binkies because this villain is serious Kaiko then goes to confess to Megamind about the big bad that's just happened. He wants to reveal the birthday surprise, saying you deserve every crumb. Here's a cake and a hero costume. Let's begin your training. And then after all this build-up of I have something to say, no, I do. You know, that classic trope because these writers haven't actually written anything original the entire time. She then just turns around and says... My mom has a thing for me at home, so I gotta go. Nothing! She goes home! <laughs> does nothing! Confession deleted. As we come to the cliffhanger that Machia Villain has reappeared. Time for the final episode. Episode 8, Who Wants to Save the City? The final episode. It's the final boss and it's all about presentation. He to super villainy is presentation. He's an elf twink. I thought he was going to be like this big kind of brutish wide shouldered guy. This does not match the voice at all. Why is his brain not visible? Did his brain just come out of his shell? How? None of this connects at all. But it's time for Machiavillain's major plan. It's not to destroy Megamind, it's to destroy who he thinks he's become. Now, suddenly there's a comet. It happens every 100 days. 100 days? That's three times a year. Meanwhile, now, finally, Keiko confesses about the binky to Chum. And about Machiavellan, and he keeps freaking out despite supposedly having to be quiet at this moment. And Megamind is meant to be out there doing a big display that everyone's there to see for the Comet Festival. But he overslept, rushing out. Meaning Keiko can't confess to him, he's too late, he won't listen. You know, it's that damn plotline again. To which Machiavellan appears on the TV. Finally, nothing barred. The plotline is finally here. Five hours into this cinematic universe. And you know, it's vaguely almost okay. It's a back and forth scene between Megamind and Machiavelli on the screen. We favor to win. It doesn't matter if you win or lose. It's how well you play the game. It's vaguely trying to follow the tropes of him talking to Metro Man, which is great. It's not done that great, but it's vaguely there. So Machiavelli says return to villainy or be faced with the ultimate challenge because this show is written for literal three-year-olds. And Machiavellian goes to put Megamind onto a giant evil game show. Who wants to save the city? You know, the name of the damn thing. Megamind has one hour to pass three heroic challenges. If you stop all three, I will leave in peace. Why? Why isn't he looking at the camera? This is going to Megamind and he's looking off screen like he's at a press conference. So anyway, it then becomes three very basic riddles. The first takes them to the dome telescope place, whereby they see that Pierre Pressure is there, who's going to hypnotize all of Metro City at once. So after duplicating himself multiple times, I don't know, I don't know how they did that. The two of them fight. Megamind has rapid fire shots against them all and misses a bunch, destroying the whole place. And then they move to the next. Number two takes them to the power station, where Lady Doppler is there with a flash flood of lightning. She says to which. Keiko literally just comes out walking to distract her as they then water hose her to zap her down. 
Why is there a water hose next to a power station? I don't know. But now the power grid is fried as well. And then the last location is at Mega Mind's lair. As because of the electric grid going down, they manage to walk in, not worry about security. And then when security do come in, because there's an emergency backup generator that gave them time to go into the lair apparently, Machiavillian immediately presses a button to make all the brain bots go to his side. Because there is a button for that apparently. Now the brain bots are committing all of the crimes out in the streets. So Mega Mind's like, hey, we can break the antenna to stop all of them at once. So then there's a remote to the laser satellite in the sky that they have, just in the car. So they press the button, it shoots the antenna, wahoo. Except in reality, what happens is the laser shoots the comet in the sky. Now it's heading towards Metro City. It's the comet will destroy the town plotline. And Megamind, in his incredibly brainless way, is just like... Megamind will know what to do! I have no idea what to do! Yeah, he's like, it's a hero problem way above my hero grade. And then he goes on to reveal, oh my god, he never intentionally defeated Machiavillian. He accidentally left the Gamma Chamber on while heating a burrito, and it burnt down his entire fortress to ashes. And that lie, I went from being an ordinary villain to a super one. When? When when he was in prison? Megamind then goes on to montage, super dosing up his gun in order to shoot down the comet. It, it's a whole shebang thing, uh, vaguely. And then... Hey, Comet! This one's for the dinosaurs. It didn't work. And instead what happens is Machia Villain makes an appearance using the binky. Superman flies up to the Megamind statue chest burns it so that it could also fly and that's right machiavillian steps in to be the new superhero coming down to the crowd saying metro city's true hero has arrived there's only three minutes left of this episode how are they gonna loop this together without pacing issues keiko then goes down and says it's all my fault i gave him the binky wah 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 Megamind's like, the binky is the last thing I have from my home world. He's immediately not upset about that because Machiavillian tricked the both of them. And then a final press conference comes out whereby we see all of Megamind's actions recontextualized. With Machiavillian saying he's returned to his old evil ways, shooting the telescope, destroying the power grid, unleashing the brain bot and detouring the comet towards us. And Roxanne, as the mayor, with no time to really process it or understand any opinion, despite clearly having emotional ties to make sense of this, has to declare Megamind as public enemy number one. Through and through, Machiavillian has won. So, how do you think they solve it in less than a minute, would you say? How do you think they're going to end this TV series? I'll tell you how, with one simple clip. Oh my god. We still have one card left to play. Have to find Metro Man. And that is the fucking ending. There is no conclusion to this episode. There is no conclusion to this full story arc. Machiavillian has made an appearance. He comes in, one shots Megamind and wins. And Megamind says, hey, let's go find Metro Man. Cut to credits. There are no more episodes of Mega Mind Rules. There are eight episodes, and that is it. No episode nine. They are coming for low budget CGI Markiplier. No conclusion, no payoff. And I wouldn't be surprised if this series is dead in the water after this response. Wouldn't that be hilarious? Mega Mind the Peacock series is cancelled, and it ends with Mega Mind just being bloody destroyed. I've been saying throughout this series while I was watching it, and in Mega Mind 2 too, where is Metro Man? Are they not gonna touch him? He's clearly gonna be a character they're gonna wanna bring back from the dead. Yeah, they're bringing him back for season two. That's it. This incredibly poorly designed super villain mentor that shouldn't exist in the lore pops in does his thing, doesn't get concluded. This cinematic universe they've introduced is triple the length of the original. It is a gigantic stain bigger than the legacy at this point of the actual Megamind, and that's where they end it. Megamind rules is literally incomplete. It is unfinished schmuck. 
I have wasted six hours of my time watching these two projects together. And that's not even including the hour and 16 minutes I spent talking about this one and then the editing I'm going to do afterwards. This has been an absolute mind-melting catastrophe. It's so cheap. Every set is reused as much as possible. And there is no originality in any line, in any character, in any plot. It's just a TV series extension schmuck. It's a content farm of Megamind. An official content farm. I've seen the inner workings of how Minecraft content farms function, and I wouldn't be surprised if this TV series is just as much a disaster as that. I detest Minecraft content farms, and I detest this. Oh my god, we are so far gone from the original Megamind now. And I know if they do make another season of this, I'm gonna have to watch it. They're gonna make Metro Man low poly. The last project, Megamind vs. The Doom Syndicate, put me into a fever for five days. This is more than double the length of that, so I guess I will see you in April when I'm done falling into the unconscious plane. On that terrible note, I'm gonna end things off there. My name's been Daz. Thank you for making it to the end of this god-awful series. Honestly, if I don't die in the next week, I might consider doing other terrible low-budget TV series, because this, this was a gold mine of something. So let me know what you'd like to see, and I will see you in a little bit. Oh, good god. to be better than this.